Hello, my name is Dr. Chester Griffiths. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation of our ambitious program to develop a community-based cochlear implant program to increase patient access to hearing care at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. This is year one progress report. The program was launched in May of 2022, and this is the update of our last 12 months up to May 2023. This will encompass a presentation that I, I gave at the American Cochlear Implant Alliance uh, International Meeting in Dallas, Texas, term Barriers, Opportunity, and Hope in Developing a Community Cochlear Implant Program with my esteemed colleagues and the stewards of this program, Dr. Courtney, Courtney Volker and Dr. Rebecca Lewis. First, I'd like to give thanks and acknowledgement and appreciation to our supporters and our partners in this pursuit of quality healthcare in the neurosciences. First and foremost, Carrie and Will Singleton of the Singleton Foundation have been instrumental in launching the PNI's Brain Health Program, which the cochlear implant program is a very important facet of. Yes, it takes a village to be able to make a change in our community. With our partners and uh, side by side uh, uh, warriors uh, for good health care, uh, St. John's Health Center and Providence Health Enterprises with Eric Wetzer, our national champion and our local champion, Michael Ricks, the St. John's Health Center Foundation led by Roger Wacker, who's on our foundation board as well, and uh, Cheryl Bourgeois, our Pacific Neuroscience Institute Foundation board, who has tirelessly given their time, energy, and guidance. Uh, I'd like to call out my co-chair, Thomas Geiser, and the first beneficiaries of the hearing uh, restoration project, Susie and Ted Schneider. Ted Schneider also serves on the PNIF board. I'd like to introduce you all to our alliance and uh, collaboration with the foremost hearing research and restoration program in the world uh, in Hanover, Germany, with Professor Majid Sami and Professor Amir Sami, with the esteemed savant and visionary in hearing care, Professor Thomas Lennartz. With, with them, we will be able to push the envelope in the next decade uh, to obtain better hearing uh, and better understanding for our patients. Lastly, our industry supporters uh, and partners, the Cochlear Corporation, Advanced Bionics, and Medel, uh, all uh, forward thinkers and leaders in the cochlear implant and hearing care space. I'll contend that we are this village that will be able to make a substantial impact in the next decade in hearing care. So in this presentation, it may be a little long-winded, but it's a product of over three years of intense research and inquiry. Uh, first, I'd like to pre present the state of cochlear implants. The first implant was performed in the House Ear Institute in 1972. It was FDA approved for children in 1990, Thus, there's a 33-year, three-decade experience. There has been static growth and static patient access over the last two decades, which is the focus of this community-based program. Defining this cochlear implant access crisis uh, entailed some analysis of professional surveys, focus groups, and then some thoughts. Uh, these are thoughts. Uh, we will prove them or not, and we'll try to find a parallel path to improve patient access. I'll review the PNI uh, Cochlear Implant Year One progress and our plans for Year Two. Ambitious but achievable. The PNI Hearing Restoration Project uh, was launched with the recruitment of Dr. Courtney Volker an esteemed neurotologist with a storied educational and academic career. 
um, starting at Brown University, obtaining her a PhD in neuroregenerative stem cell research at Oxford, performing her head, neck, and ear, nose, and throat residency at Washington University in St. Louis, her neurotology fellowship uh, at the House Ear Institute. Uh, she was a professor at Northwestern, recruited to lead the program at USC, both in adult and cochlear, pediatric cochlear implantation, over the last five years, leading that program at Children's Hospital Los Angeles. With Becky Lewis, uh, another esteemed uh, academician and uh, clinician in the uh, space of audiology and cochlear implant, she is a unique specialist in both pediatric cochlear implantation and adult cochlear implantation, studying at Indiana University, her postdoctorate at Vanderbilt, uh, then spending time at UCLA, the House Ear Institute, and USC before joining us at uh, Pacific Neuroscience Institute. And myself, um, one of the co-founders of the Pacific Neuroscience Institute and co-director of the Eye, Ear, Nose, and Skull-based Center of Excellence of the Institute, I am their cheerleader and I'm so honored to be able to push this agenda forward with them. So what have we done this last year? We've just presented our work at the uh, 2023 Cochlear Implant Alliance. Uh, both Dr. Volker and uh, Dr. Lewis were given a seat at the table at the National Cochlear Implant uh, uh, Day presentation uh, where they presented uh, our current status of our program, a novel program at that, and myself presenting our results of year one to the general uh, participants and audience uh, in the cochlear implant space. For those of you who do not know about the Pacific Neuroscience Institute, um, I'd like to just briefly give you an overview of how and why a cochlear implant program is so important to our mission. Uh, Pacific Neuroscience Institute was founded by myself, an ear, nose, and throat, anterior skull based surgeon, a neurosurgeon, Dr. Daniel Kelly, a neuro ophthalmologist, Dr. Howard Krauss, and a neuro neurooncologist, uh, Dr. Santos Kessri. We primarily focused on personalized patient centric care first. Uh, with a vertically integrated neuroscience care model, uh, taking the promise of academic centers into a practice in, in our institute. Thus, a patient with a complex neuroscience uh, disease can see three to four specialists and have imaging on the same day. Along with a focus on discovery, innovation, and research led by physicians and shepherded by physicians, uh, that we understand the issues that we need and the problems that we need to give solutions to our patients to, and allowing us to create novel uh, structures to be able to, to give answers to our patients. The cochlear implant program is an example of one of those agendas. We now have 42 clinicians across 14 specialties at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute and this is a list of some of those specialties. So how did the cochlear implant program come to be? And it has everything to do with brain health. Uh, in this presentation, you'll uh, be enlightened to the importance of hearing and the impact on cognitive decline and dementia that hearing loss has and the ability to reverse that cognitive decline uh, utilizing the technology of a cochlear implant, along with changing the life of a child born deaf. In our Pacific Neuroscience Brain Health Center of Excellence, we approach it in a holistic approach, not just one arm, but multiple arms of intervention to achieve a good outcome. In the cochlear implant program, which is novel, we're not just rehabilitating the hearing, 
we're going to integrate vision optimization, uh, preventions of uh, falls and neuromuscular disorders, cognitive fitness and healthy aging, olfactory evaluation and olfactory stimulation and, and enhancement, depression and anxiety evaluations, and most importantly, social engagement and volunteerism support to reintegrate these patients with hearing loss that have become reclusive and uh, separated socially from them, from their uh, friends and most importantly, from their loved ones. Thus, this holistic multimodality approach to brain health uh, with all of these uh, aspects of connectomics, transmagnetic stimulation, our TRIP program, uh, with uh, research in psychedelics, exercise, nutrition, and sleep, cognitive fitness and fit brain, social engagement and volunteerism, all will be part of the research that we will be doing along with integrating cochlear implants. Naturally, let's talk a little bit about the status of the cochlear implants in our country. There are esteemed, very mature, and advanced academic programs in our country. These are some examples. The University of North Carolina cochlear implant team has performs 300 cochlear implants a year, five surgeons with one neurotology fellow and 54 professional staff. Uh, the University of Iowa performs 200 cochlear implants a year, three surgeons and one fellow with the same amount of professional supporting staff. But this does not even scratch the surface of the need of our community and of our nation of cochlear implants and hearing rehabilitation. These programs are extremely vital and necessary to push the envelope of the technology and to understand what works and what doesn't work on a research basis. But one of our aspects of the community-based cochlear implantation is taking it to the grassroots community to offer access and to offer the amazing ability to hear to patients that right now are not. So the playing field nationally, uh, this is the members of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance. There's 125 members in the alliance, only 15 are non-university based, 15 are community based, that's 12%. In California, uh, there are nine centers, uh, uh, excuse me, eight centers, the Pacific Neuroscience Institute being one of them in California. And we are one of two community based uh, cochlear implant programs along with the House Air Institute. Thus again, underscoring this need to expand the access at the community. The Pacific Neuro Neuroscience Hearing Restoration Project is based in three arms. First, community hearing education outreach with primary care education and patient education. The lack of hearing evaluation and understanding on the primary care grassroots level is a crisis and through the ability to offer in office hearing evaluations that are validated that are table based uh, hearing tests and integrating that as part of an annual wellness exam not only educates the primary care physician but engages the patient in their hearing care the hearing aid Recycling program is part of this with our HOPE HARP program, um, which when patients are not using their hearing aids, they are recycling them and we are donating them to the less fortunate and less advantaged. Our community-based cochlear implant program, which will be the focus of this uh, presentation, uh, is just that, breaking the access crisis. And the moonshot is the development of a nanobiologic research project to address neuroregeneration on a cellular level with focus on hearing loss. And that's where truly our affiliation with the, uh, our colleagues in Hanover, Germany uh, will be so advantageous. 
A sad fact is that for every $1 donated for blindness research, three cents is donated to hearing loss. We need to change that paradigm and raise awareness in our community to the impact that hearing loss is having on our wellness and our quality of life. In our sandbox, what is the issue? What is the playing field in Los Angeles? In our metropolitan area, we have 18,800,000 residents, of which two and a half million are over 65 years of age, 13% of the population. Right now, two to 3% of the 1.3 million cochlear implant adult candidates in our country receive a cochlear implant. That means that 0.3% of the population in the United States are cochlear implant uh, candidates, but only two to 13% are receiving them. In our area in Los Angeles, there are only four members of the American Cochlear Implant Alliance that are performing cochlear implants as a priority. Four centers for 18.8 million residents. Thus, it is right now, those centers are implanting 350 cochlear implants. In our area, there's over 300 independent audiology practices that are not engaged in cochlear implantation. And thus, looking at this from the 40,000 foot level down, you would say that should be the focus of any outreach program, really focusing on those 300 independent audiology practices to increase access. In that, let's drill it down to what the potential candidates in, in greater Los Angeles. This is a uh, validated uh, estimation of the number of patients with severe to profound hearing loss. I did not even include moderate hearing loss where some patients will be candidates for cochlear implants. 11.6% are in Los Angeles. And we look at that aspect, if you just look at the simple math of 0.3%, of patients uh, that would require cochlear implantation in Los Angeles, 56,000 may be candidates. But if you look at this graph and estimate it, it's anywhere from 62,000 to 15,000. And we are implanting 350 a year. Right now, 1,200 children are born deaf each year in California. So what are the potential newborn CA candidates in, in greater Los Angeles? Approximately, if you look at the 1,200 born deaf in California, 47% of the population in California lives in the greater Los Angeles area. That translates to 564 children are born deaf in the greater Los Angeles area and are cochlear implant candidates. And right now, approximately 150 are being implanted. And this is supported by the recent published uh, and presented UCLA cochlear implant program. As you see, uh, they have been increasing since 2019 from 12 children a year to 46 children in 2022. But that is only 8% of the potential. And believe me, we need to address this issue as a crisis. And hopefully over the next five years, we'll be able uh, to make an impact to be able to implant uh, these children and actually identify them uh, because we believe that many of them are lost in the shuffle. A very amazing uh, agenda uh, or, or a program was started by Paul Ogden in Fresno, he was looking at the disparity of uh, the lower socioeconomic class, and they are at more greater risk to be born uh, with hearing loss. 
and thus he created a guide, both in Spanish and English, called the Silent Garden, uh, for parents. And believe me, it is it is a uh, monumental psychologic impact when a child is born deaf to hearing parents. Uh, and his foundation is called the Sunflowers in the Silent Garden. And uh, these books will be allow us to have greater outreach to our community of children in newborn nurseries when there is a child born deaf. So moving on in the evaluation of this poor access crisis, we performed an, a survey, random survey, asking the participants to list five reasons for this access crisis. The survey was divided into community uh, professionals, audiologists, and hearing aid dispensers. 20 responded. Interestingly, their responses were short and to the point. The opportunities that we can make an out, out impact are listed here uh, as an opportunity. First is the fear of surgery. Cannot reverse once, once, once done. Uh, patients saying they want to wait for better technology. Two is misinformation about cochlear implants in general. The mythology of a cochlear implant, that it's brain surgery, that it's poor sound, that they may not fit the indications, that there's age limits. There's an opportunity to impact that. Geographic distance was to a CI center was one of the major uh, uh, points that was brought up by the community uh, cochlear implant centers. This is another opportunity that this program may address. The appearance of the cochlear implant at this point is something that is uh, stagnant and we won't be able to address. And of course, the cost of the procedure. Most patients fear that it will be very expensive to them. And that is an opportunity to educate uh, the different programs, uh, Medicare, Medic, uh, Medi-Cal, CCS, and philanthropy to be able to, to uh, soften those fears. Then we had the second group, which was industry representatives. 14 responded. Interestingly, the responses were passionate, long-winded, and detailed. Many, many pages on, on, on the list of regions and explanations. I think this really exemplifies the frustration of these professionals trying to increase access, but falling short. Um, number one was fear of surgery. Again, the first issue that was brought up by the hearing aid dispensers. The sophistication of the community audiologists, hearing aid dispensers. And I put this as a bias and a tremendous opportunity. The desire of community audi audiologists not to lose business or control of the patient. And when I look at this, again, a bias, and I would reframe this, and you'll hear this in uh, the further points of the presentation, that it's not so much that they don't want to lose business or sell another hearing aid. I believe that they don't want to lose money doing cochlear implants, which is the unfortunate reality now. It is just financially not viable for most audiology, audiology practices to perform them. Uh, geographic distance, of course, the 10 mile rule, patients don't want to travel long distances and with only four cochlear implant programs uh, for the rehab and the uh, service. And that CI programs that exist in Los Angeles have very long wait times and patients lose interest or motivation. These reasons are very, very uh, addressable and solutions can be made so that the access issue can be addressed. First, fear of surgery. It is not brain surgery, it's ear surgery. And looking at the published data over with multiple studies, over 2000 patients uh, uh, included, have concluded that age is not a factor in performing a cochlear implant. In fact, over 90 years of age, it gives so much uh, benefit to those patients to be able to hear and their quality of life. It's an outpatient anesthesia performed under a de-sedation technique. The time in the surgery center is three hours, two hours in the operating room. 
Only a bandage over the ear to prevent blood clot formation is applied. 2% of patients have some transient dizziness related to the manipulation of the inner ear uh, system, but that's uh, the, the biggest uh, issue that they may have. And these studies have considered this extremely safe at all ages, six months to 90 years of age. And thus, this fear of surgery is just uh, subjective. It is not objective. Here are some, for the uh, uh, people listening, here are some uh, videos that I would encourage you to watch. You can pause now and scan these and watch these. But these will be, these QR codes will be listed at the end of the procedure, at the end of the presentation, excuse me. Um, the cochlear implant program, uh, Dr. Boca will explain it. What is a cochlear implant by Dr. Becky Lewis? The myths of cochlear implants and actually a tutorial and a video of a cochlear implant surgeon that was published by the New England Journal of Medicine to again dispel this mythology of fear of surgery. Complications are rare and self-limited. Most complications is wound infection or hematoma 10% of the time, normally treated with outpatient antibiotics. The device malfunction or extrusion may occur in less than 1%. Meningitis facial nerve weakness is very rare now that we give a meningitis vaccination preoperatively. Uh, the one uh, study here had one case of meningitis and in Dr. Volker's series, she has not encountered that. There is no stroke, no deaths or no life incapacitating complications reported with a cochlear implant. And thus, again, this fear of surgery has to be dispelled as mythology. It's considered safe from ages up to 90 years of age. So let's look at the benefits of cochlear implants. First, the major benefit is in children, along with the major benefit in treating cognitive decline and dementia in adults. This is a study that was just uh, presented by the University of Miami, looking at cochlear implants that were performed before 18 months of age, cochlear implants that were performed after 18 months of age in the pediatric population versus cochlear implants that were not performed at all. And by age six, the results are presented in this graph. This is the median graph of all children by age six and their performance in language, math, reading, writing, and science. In the blue chart, as you see here, reading, writing, in children that were implanted 18 months or younger was equal or better than their peers. Imagine taking a child that has been born deaf and with a simple technological intervention, they will equal their peers in educational ability and socialization ability by age six. In the children, less than uh, uh, language are equal to their peers uh, after uh, 18 months. And in no CI uh, uh, placement, and this is this group down here. So these are the children that did not have a cochlear implant. Their language, reading, math, and science scores were poorer than their peers. And thus, transitioning this group of patients into this group of patients with access of a technology that is safe uh, should be a major social and political uh, uh, priority. Looking at the benefits of cochlear implants in adults, again, looking at our brain health program. Uh, these are three studies that I'd like to highlight. Um, in this study, 81% of patients had cognitive improvement after one year after receiving a cochlear implant. They had moderate to severe hearing loss. Their speech understanding was improved. They had decrease in depression. They had improved self-esteem and improved socialization. 
In this study, evaluating the implex of cochlear implants on cognitive function specifically uh, in older adults, the mean age of implantation was almost 80 years of age. They had overall a significant cognitive improvement after the cochlear implantation. And this is a, uh, a clinical current review and opinion that was performed. They looked at 21 publications in the literature. They concluded that it is a low risk surgery, it improves autonomy, and it improves quality of life in adults. So there is absolutely no question that in now over 23 published peer reviewed studies, that cochlear implant has a dramatic impact on the cognitive ability and quality of life for patients that are candidates. Let's look at the financial and societal benefits of co cochlear implants, the cost beneficial and life impactful impact of this. So again, this was the University of Miami's uh, study. This is a lifetime cost for individuals with uh, significant hearing loss. As you see, they looked at early onset hearing loss, early implantation, no implantation, and late onset. So this is truly in the pediatric population. And the major impact that cochlear implant has is in earning potential. That means integration into normal society. And as you see here, someone that had early implantation versus no implantation, the costs were half a million dollars for that patient, excuse me, 500,000 or half a million, and a million dollars for the lifetime of the non-implanted with the earning issue being the biggest impact. Thus, this million dollars could be decreased by 50% if that patient received a cochlear implant. In the adult space, no cochlear implantation. Again, you're looking at almost a $200,000 uh, cost uh, impact to that patient's life. That's on the individual, but when looking then extrapolated to the entire society, how this impacts with all the patients that have cochlear implants that are, or have not received cochlear implants or hearing care uh, and the cost to society. Again, the major societal impact, and this is a high estimation, and this is a low estimation, $21 billion a year could be cut in half by cochlear implantation, up to $47 billion a year. Again, looking at the societal cost of lack of access to cochlear implantation, that should be a major stimulus and motivator for our society and our uh, political structures to encourage cochlear implantation uh, for quality of life, wellness, and cost to society. So what is a, our goal in developing a community-based cochlear implant program? First aspect was studying what exists. And I use this model here, inside out, which exists today, meaning the, the current research and academic programs are centered with all the services inside of the academic center. Thus, they then push the patients out to the community. Thus, the traditional model inside out. I would state that this model here is very important for research and innovation, but for actually delivering the care that is so needed, obviously over the last two decades, with the flat uh, stagnant growth in access, this model is currently unsustainable to address the needs for hearing care and cochlear implantation in our, in our community. My hypothesis is a hybrid method, the outside in, meaning community audiology hearing health providers manage the CI patients, manage their patients that they have relationships with, receive the 
training and mentorship of the CI center audiologist, refer the patient into the CI center for the surgery and possibly the activation. And I'll go through the different uh, uh, algorithms that a community audiology practice can participate in. So the cochlear implant surgeon performs the procedure. Thus, the community audiologist maintains that long-term care relationship with the patient, and thus the geographic issues are negated and the access is improved. Thus, the outside-in model. And I would even go to say it's the outside inclusion model, including our community audiology professionals and hearing care professionals in this delivery system of hearing health care. Secondly, looking at our commitment to primary care provider hearing health education including the primary care provider on the ground level and grassroots, grassroots level. Again, a commitment to the community audiology practices, including them in the process, listening to them, understanding what their issues are, giving them support and education to fulfill this mission. And of course, including you, all of you listening to this program uh, our presentation, in the grassroots community philanthropic partnerships because there, there has to be support to address this problem financially, to support outreach, research, and charity care, most importantly. In, outside inclusion is the uh, uh, mantra of this, uh, this uh, program that we are going to try to uh, expand and see if this makes an impact over the next five years. So what have we done in our first year uh, uh, of launching our community cochlear implant program? Well, first it was fast and furious. Uh, we recruited our neurotologist, Dr. Courtney Volker, our community, uh, our cochlear implant audiologist, Dr. Uh, Becky Lewis, We've looked at optimizing audiology workflows. We've looked at the financial implications of each step of the process. We have instituted a cochlear implant on-site coordinator, uh, uh, created a cochlear implant patient guide, have a community outreach cochlear implant coordinator, and we have a financial manager to help patients understand uh, that process. We've listed, enlisted in our uh, group manufacturers and have had great manufacturer collaborations. And I will tell you, it's the tale of the three siblings. They all are part of the cochlear implant family. But as siblings are, they have differences, they have dominance and non-dominance, but they all have the same uh, mantra and same purpose to push forward cochlear implantation. In that, I've studied and defined their unique cultures. I've looked at contracting issues with each one of them and tried to normalize the contracting paradigm to have same, same pricing structures. We've looked at this uh, cochlear implant workflow management team, integrating them uh, with our team on the other side, defining which tasks uh, are taken up by uh, which side, the, the manufacturer side, or our clinical side. We've looked at developing these educational programs and looked at collaborating with research and development. So looking at this first year, we've done a lot of groundwork and we have a lot more to go. Again, looking at the access, we get hospital-based and ambulatory surgery center uh, procedural uh, accessibility. There's no doubt that there is a, a, a role for each. There's a role for the hospital-based in, in uh, the younger population, uh, newborns, and in the older population with more comorbidities. But for the middle ground, an outpatient ambulatory surgery center uh, model is one that we have developed. We've developed the first 
ambulatory surgery center, non-hospital based uh, 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 center uh, to perform cochlear implantation on a, on a wide uh, basis in Southern California. Um, why is that uh, difficult? Because there is a big financial risk for a small center if the financial uh, responsibility is not uh, uh, supported by a third party payer. So there is a tremendous financial risk and that's where that contracting and working with the manufacturers comes in. Of course, there is some lower cost structures or co-payments, et cetera, in the ambulatory surgery uh, arena. Plus the fear factor is somewhat alleviated. Again, this was our new territory and we have now carve outs in Southern California for Anthem Blue Cross, Blue Shield and United Healthcare. So looking at that aspect, this facility engagement, both supporting the hospital and the ambulatory surgery center to have both uh, uh, options available is so important. And to look at this as a group effort to make sure that the financial viability of the program continues. And that's looking at, we do now double authorization. We get the surgeon's authorization and the facility authorization. And we do quarterly reviews of collections to optimize this process. So what is our results in our first year? Um, first, let's look at first consultations for cochlear implants versus comp completed procedures. I'll tell you that our screening is pretty good. We had 8, 108 patients uh, that called for first consultations and 107 were uh, cochlear implant candidates. And as you see, the number uh, continues to rise over the quarterly basis. How many of those patients, 107 that were cochlear implant candidates actually went ahead and had the cochlear implant? 48 patients. Now, for a year one novel from zero to now cochlear implant program, 48 per patients in the first year is an accomplishment. Um, thus, we converted 44% of this 107 patients. We did look at why patients did not elect to have surgery. Uh, but we also looked at the referral sources. I'll get to the uh, reasons why they didn't in, one, in the next slide. In the first consultations, again, looking at this was very important in developing our community-based strategy. 40, 37% of the referrals came from community audiologists. 22 came from ear, nose, and throat doctors. 16 were self-referrals. Six from our, our primary care colleagues. Four from our manufacturers and 15 from others. Looking at reasons why patients chose not to proceed with a cochlear implant. Insurance coverage in the younger population with single-sided deafness was the most common reason. 29 patients, 48% of those that did not proceed, actually were related to single-sided deafness. And up to this last month, these were not covered by commercial insurance, being considered medically not necessary. Interestingly enough, if you look at the paradigm of a cataract in one eye, and saying to someone, oh, you have another eye that is seeing and you don't need the cataract surgery. That is analogous to someone coming in with single-sided deafness and the insurance company stating, oh, we have one good ear, so we're not going to cover the one that you lost hearing. I will encourage you to listen to one of the uh, videos that's presented at the end of a 32-year-old patient that suddenly lost her hearing in her ear. She did proceed with a cochlear implantation, self-financed, and her results, um, you'll be quite uh, impressed. The second issue is fear. That's something we could totally address, and we're going to address that in, in our program, as you'll see. Uh, 23 patients scared of surgery, they're overwhelmed, et cetera. So now, as I was stating, Anthem Blue Cross, June 1st, approved cochlear implants for single-sided deafness. This is really going to be beneficial for our younger patients that have sudden sensor and neural hearing loss. Again, in our first year, we 
University. We have a non-university based newborn cochlear implant program. Here's one of our patients at seven months being implanted. Uh, and there is a video of the activation that you, I would encourage you to watch. We have a multilinguistic Spanish and Korean cochlear implant access program. And I encourage you to watch the uh, activation of this very successful Korean businessman who suddenly lost hearing in one ear and eight months later lost his hearing in his other ear, became reclusive and isolated. And after his cochlear implant, after six years, he can hear for the first time. Watch the activation with, of his cochlear implant with his daughter in attendance. And of course, hospital-based and ambulatory surgery center access-based care. Here's our team at Providence St. John's operating room, and here's our team at our the PNI ambulatory surgery center. Uh, this is a great marriage to uh, allow access to the patients. But what is one of the major barriers if you're going to look at a, a community-based cochlear implant program focusing on community audiology. Right now, first we have to reframe it. It's not that they want to sell another hearing aid or they don't want to lose business. They really don't want to lose money doing cochlear implantation. And on Main Street, that is an important issue of keeping the lights on and being financially sustainable. Right now, for the one year rehabilitation, activation, evaluation process, the commercial insurers and the uh, uh, and Medicare reimburse for all that care $1,600. That does not come close to the financial resources and man hours, which is about 20, 20 hours plus, 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 uh, to optimize the impact of the cochlear implant. So one of our areas of research and development is how to optimize reimbursement for audiology services on the community level. At universities, they have an, a, an advantage uh, from increased reimbursements and uh, other financial incentives to be able to support these programs. Uh, on the grassroots Main Street level, those uh, programs aren't available and thus, this is a very important uh, impact that we're going to be studying and, and evaluating with our community-based audiology uh, partners. In that, the community-based audiology inclusion really includes education and support. The purpose is to overcome the geographical and knowledge barriers, fostering local, local patient care, fostering the relationships that have been developed over uh, uh, many years, decades or, or longer, and giving the technology confidence to those uh, community audiology practices. So first is determining how they want to be involved. Do they want to be involved in the activation process or not? Do they want to only be involved in the rehabilitation process or not? Do they just want to be a referral base with long-term support upon us returning the patients to their practice? Each audiology uh, center will determine what level of involvement they will have. But the most important is that they will be included in the process. Creating a basic and advanced certification process to overcome the uh, knowledge barriers. Continuing, Medicaid, uh, continuing audiology and medical education and expertise development with the development of a syllabus-based and accountable uh, educational structure uh, to maintain the expertise will be part of the RP&I uh, outreach. And most importantly, for these community-based audiologists, ease and immediate accessibility to the cochlear implant experts, both surgeon and audiologists. Dr. Volker and Dr. Lewis are passionate about this. They are passionate to be available and they have a love for educating and supporting their colleagues. As close as a phone call or as close as a text message, accessibility to support uh, this effort. 
optimizing this teamwork is equitable audiology financial reimbursement for services rendered. Naturally, any business person realizes that there has to be equitable uh, financial uh, stability. One of the things we've studied and done is we've looked at all of the services covered and non-covered and looked at the model of co-management and looking at patient service agreements, platinum plans or gold plans. For those patients that can't afford it, they would choose a platinum or gold plan. Uh, that would include, for example, hearing aid programming, device support out of sequence, patient support out of sequence, patient cognitive brain health rehabilitation, um, and for those patients that can't afford it, philanthropy, institutional uh, support, industry support, or other mechanisms to support the delivery of this optimal uh, care. Um, these uncovered services model uh, is based on and approved currently by co-management agreements or co-management structures uh, in the CMS platform in ophthalmology, cataracts, LASIK surgery, glaucoma surgery, et cetera. So this teamwork is already in practice in the eye space. We have to design and implement this for financial equi equitable uh, support for community audiologists as the ophthalmologists did with their optometrists. Another opportunity looking at is changing the paradigm in uh, teaching at the uh, graduate level for new uh, audiologists. Right now, when you look at this graph, you see that there's a propensity of audiologists at university centers to be in practice 20 to 30 years. There is a very small amount that are in practice uh, one to 10 years. We have to flip that paradigm to be able to encourage more young audiologists to be involved, interested in uh, cochlear implantation so that they can again uh, support the community audiology uh, program. So we need to foster the next gen CI uh, audiologist legacy. Right now, as I said, 45% for less than 10 years, 55% are 10 to 30 years. Another opportunity again is to uh, this audiology uh, community inclusion, mentoring the community audiologists, the patient stays with the community ideologist, the education programs that I had previously reviewed, and to continue our focus groups and understanding and communication with these groups uh, to uh, develop this program. Um, we, have, we need to continue to understand their needs and uh, their vulnerabilities um, uh, in the development of this program. So what are our goals? Year two. Yes, they're ambitious and achievable. We'd like to pilot 12 community audiology clinics to validate this out-in model. We would like to then also work with our brain health team to create a holistic approach to cochlear implantation and dementia. Um, currently uh, integrating uh, and, and starting research in integrating all the methods of support of cognitive rehabilitation. Right now, cochlear implant programs only look at the cochlear implant hearing aspect, but integrating that with cognitive fitness, olfactory stimulation, uh, uh, vision enhancement, psychosocial integration, and all of those aspects and to see how that impacts the ultimate cognitive uh, rehabilitation. We want to expand the p and and International Neuroscience Institute collaboration and the University of Hanover to continue basic science research with Dr. Sammy and Lenartz. And we would like to create an exploratory committee to create and talk about a neuroregenerative nanobiology research center to address and focus on hearing loss uh, neuroregeneration. We'd like to implement a psychology patient support group 
to address the fear associated with and the social isolation associated with a hearing loss and that of cochlear implantation. We would like to grow our volume by a modest 50%, 75 cochlear implants in our next year. We'd like to launch a community-based pediatric hearing care and cochlear implant program. We have already had talks with the John Tracy Clinic and the Venice Family Clinic uh, that are dedicated to pediatric uh, support. And I love this uh, a picture of the heart with the cochlear implant and the John Tracy Clinic. We'd like to be able to financially be viable and attract like-minded fa faculty to support our purpose. And of course, we'd like to expand our community-based philanthropic partnerships to support this program, outreach, research, and most importantly, charity care. In summary, our mission is to develop our community-based cochlear implant program, striving to advance patients' ability and their quality of life to improve their ability to communicate with loved ones and to enhance their cognitive well-being. Our interdisciplinary cochlear implant team at PNI treats patients across the lifespan from infancy to older adults using evidence-based practices, innovation, and a compassionate approach to care. And I hope that you join us in this mission. To get involved, with the Pacific Neuroscience Foundation or the St. John's Health Center Foundation. Here, here's our team, Pam Solomon at the Health Center Foundation with Megan Church, Chris Cosgrove, and you have full access to Dr. Volker, Dr. Lewis, and myself. I'm going to uh, conclude with the statement of Arthur C. Clarke, which I've always admired. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I would say we have magic and hope and let's make an impact on the hearing care world. Please take a moment to uh, scan these and learn about the cochlear implant program, some of the issues of cochlear implants, witness the activation of a cochlear implant, even witness the cochlear implant surgery, uh, in the activation process of a, a newborn and a, a older adult and hearing for the first time. Um, and the uh, testimonial of a 32 year old that lost their hearing and now can hear again.